Well, <clears throat> greetings, Pipe Pals. How y'all doing? This is old Holy Smoke and Pipe Padre. And I'm showing you some ferns that I have growing here in my backyard, in my patio. There's my sister's rhombifolias. There's a, an asparagus fern. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but uh, usually what I do is I let them stay out here uh, during the daytime and then I bring them in at night. Okay, let's see if this is going to work here. How are y'all doing? Let me see if I can... Uh, hmm. That seems to be working out too well. Let's see if that's going to work. Hold on a second. Hmm. I think that's going to work out okay. Yeah, how y'all doing? No, I am uh, smoking a, a Boots Chocan uh, Calabash here, Briar Calabash. And in it, I am smoking Shillam's Red in honor of the Blood Red Moon tomorrow night. Okay, or tonight if you're watching this video. Maybe I'm making it the day before. So, in honor of the Red Moon on the 27th, I guess it is. Sitting out here with the chickens. Hi chickens. Hi guys. How you doing? Hi chickens. Now you've already been fed. Yeah. Go 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 play now. Go play. There you go. Okay. Sweet little chicken. Yeah. Okay. They actually let me pet them every now and then. No, they're not really domesticated, but they're quite sweet little animals. And boy are they tasty. Just kidding. Tastes like chicken. Okay. Well, um, let's see, I've been away for a week or so. And uh, uh, it's been a couple weeks since I've even had a pipe. And I was down uh, last week, I was away <coughs> uh, to Menlo Park, uh, St. Patrick's Seminary. Actually, I was not at the seminary per se, but I was um, about a mile from there. We have a retreat house <clears throat> down there called Velambrosia. Uh, it's run by the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And I uh, spent many uh, workshops there and seminars there, even when I was in the seminary. So anyway, it's uh, going back to Menlo Park uh, was Kind of, kind of an interesting experience. I'll try to run some of the videos now as I'm talking about uh, St. Patrick's um, and maybe Menlo Park. I don't know. I, I didn't take a lot of videos. I um, I, I intended to really um, kind of do a lot more <clears throat> uh, with my stay there, kind of, kind of getting reacquainted with uh, Menlo Park and. Uh, I was even going to go for a run, <clears throat> one of the runs that I used to do. Uh, I kind of attribute it to the my very first time I lost weight um, back in the seminary, and I thought it'd be fun to, to run run again that course. Uh, maybe as you're watching this, I'm showing you kind of part of that where I used to uh, take off from the seminary and run through part of the seminary grounds to get to outer Menlo Park and then go down this road that I used to used to go. But um, well time is a, an interesting factor and a lot of uh, us probably have experienced when we go back to something in our past. One of the uh, things that we <clears throat> sadly discover is that it has changed. Some things remain the same but a lot of things have changed. And that was uh, the case for me when I went back to the seminary and went back to yeah. Menlo Park. I believe Menlo Park is where Thomas Alva Edison also once lived, as well as their late great Steve Jobs, or Palo Alto. Palo Alto, Menlo Park, they kind of, kind of blend. Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Atherton, you know, all kind of go to blend together. 
anyway, um, so that being said, um, uh, when I got there though, to the seminary, and I started, you know, kind of looking around the place and even kind of, I didn't get a chance to really visit my old room, but I got to go where it used to be. Uh, the person that lives there now wasn't there, so I wasn't able to have him open it up just so I could look in. That might have been kind of hard too, because you know, again, it's a space that I used to occupy for like five years, and who knows what it's like now. So, um, but for the most part, um, <clears throat> it was a bit of a uh, kind of a culture shock. I hadn't been back in 21 years, and I think it was just um, part of it was, although a lot of things had changed, a lot of things stayed the same. And although uh, one of my goals was to actually run the same path that I had, you know, 25 years ago, uh, I discovered that the seminary had sold off some of the grounds and there was a big development that had gone on there. So the road that I actually remember running along really wasn't there anymore. Uh, it had been completely changed. Um, and then the one road that was very similar to that, which kind of ran parallel, uh, I'm afraid that that one really wasn't uh, the actual road I ran along. And also they tore out all the the kind of the, if you will, the, the middle class homes and some very, very wealthy people moved into that area and what they did was they took out two or three contemporary homes and built these big palatial almost mansions uh, almost on every block. So it's sort of like, well, that's not exactly what I remember. So it was kind of disappointing. Also, I was, I was kind of sick. The interesting thing was I did a lot of walking. I did an awful lot of walking, just out of curiosity to see how things had changed, uh, which was good for me, but I wasn't able to run. I was feeling pretty, I was feeling kind of sick, so uh, even though I did a lot of walking, I, I wasn't, I didn't feel confident to really run. And I found out, interestingly enough, that the two mile route that I, I thought I was running was actually four miles. <laughs> It's actually about a mile, well, probably more like a mile and a half. Actually, maybe it was a mile and a half. Maybe I thought it was only two miles, one mile out and one mile back. But I always remembered it being like, well, this was kind of a short run and it turned out to be actually almost a three, four mile run. So I was kind of impressed with that. So anyway, you're probably seeing some pictures of St. Patrick's there and images of my past. So, well, I thought it would be in keeping with this past week as uh, Holy Father uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, came to America and just kind of give you my take on that now <clears throat> I uh, am aware that I probably will say some things now that, again, kind of like my other video, a difficult discussion will be discouraging to some people. Um, so now I want to say my disclaimer is I'm not here to pick any fights with anybody. I'm not here to disparage anybody. I'm not here to put anybody down. Uh, but I am here to kind of maybe shed a light on something that I think needs to be said. Uh, in light of the Pope's visit because a lot of it has uh, which it has which it continues to do and it probably will always in some regards always be this way <clears throat> there are those uh, groups of people uh, in the church are you know people that want to see the church change its traditions its teachings And a lot of times those uh, teachings and traditions uh, seem to be uh, contrary to certainly modern contemporary thought. Um,
And <clears throat> I think what I wanted to kind of try to, I've been, been trying to kind of find a, a concise way uh, and a cogent way to just kind of lay it out there, kind of like, you know, where people are at. And it's basically all the hot button issues. We, we've been over them many times. Whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it's abortion, the Catholic Church's stance on artificial contraception, uh, women priests, uh, and euthanasia now. And even immigration, I guess that's, a, that's another hot button issue one too for lots of people. Um, and so, you know, the Pope comes and what I've seen happen in the last several months uh, and actually the last couple of years is that people want to equate Pope Francis with this progressive uh, leader that's going to change all these what they could see as archaic understandings in the church and I just uh, and I've read a lot of different people who uh, in the final analysis as they were making their editorials about the Pope's visit were kind of having a sour grapes experience and and so I had the last one I saw and I read some of it which I don't need to read all of it a screed by um, Bill Maher uh, that the uh, comedian guy I guess he's a comedian I kind of see him as more of an outspoken uh, progressivist, but that's my that's my take on it. But anyway, he basically was really lambasting the Pope for being, you know, anti-woman, anti-gay, uh, anti, um, um, uh, anti-abortion, you know, and the the thing that has to be remembered. And, you know, you may not like it, you may not even understand it, but, and this is something, you know, I've, I've always kind of looked at, I said, you know, people think that they can use the media to force an institution to change. Because in many ways, the media has been very powerful in doing just that. If they feel that there's a cause that's just, we're going to rally behind the, the unjust, the, the, the discriminated group and we're going to push for their rights and we're gonna we're gonna secure those rights for them and anybody that stands up against that we're gonna mow them down we're gonna mow them down and they've been very effective and so a lot of people were thinking well you know the Pope's gonna come here he's gonna hear what we have to say and he's gonna start changing these 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 uh, teachings of the church And now, lo and behold, we find out that those teachings are not going anywhere. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people, and again, many people, as they were writing their editorials, were lamenting that, oh gosh, Pope Francis doesn't seem to be the progressive guy we thought he was. Oh, they still love him in some ways. He's a nice grandfatherly kind of a guy. You know, and um, he can, you know, be very endearing and, and does little humble acts and everything and says some interesting things. And, but for the most part, he didn't say what a lot of people were hoping he was going to say. Hi, chicken. Um, and I think that um, a lot of people have been led to believe falsely that change was coming, that change was, was going to occur sooner or later, but it was going to occur sometime soon. In the church, that is. And now people are beginning to realize that Pope Francis has said, no, we are not going to have women priests. He's pretty much said no to same-sex marriage, although, again, yes, he is quoted uh, extensively about the who am I to judge comment I actually was talking about a, a priest not a, anyone else one of the more honest commentators actually said you know guys we kind of really took that and 
we ran with it and he wasn't really talking about you know same-sex marriage or anything he was talking about a celibate priest who happened to announce that he was gay so a lot of people assumed that he was endorsing same-sex marriage on the QT but he really wasn't um, Again, uh, abortion. Well, he doesn't really say anything uh, about abortion anymore, so maybe that's going to change. No, that, that won't change. The contraception debate, uh, our issue, will not change. Uh, euthanasia. We are never. We would never endorse euthanasia. And so here's here, here are the two things that I want to kind of just put on the table, so people can kind of maybe understand. As Catholic Christians, the reason why these things will not change is simply because we believe in divine revelation. Now, most secular people today don't believe in God. They think it's all fairy tales and made up stories and, you know, a pie in the sky and mythical. Uh, image uh, creatures mythical characters like Frodo, Frodo Baggins and Gandalf and you know you believe in your little group of uh, fantasy characters and we'll believe in ours okay that, that that's what most people kind of think it is and so you know it doesn't matter what the rules are you can always change the rules well if we really believed in just fantasy mythical characters possibly yes but we believe that Jesus Christ is a real person we believe he's alive today that's the message of the church hallelujah hallelujah and we believe that the things that he left us are things that we don't have the authority to change we just don't have the authority to change those things so so people kind of well they, they kind of because they they superimpose a democracy system upon um, a divinely revealed system so you know if we were just making it up as we went along you know kind of like american politics then yeah you know whatever the the voice of the people is that's fine i heard one guy says well it should be the census fidelium means the faith of the people well the faith of the people doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means faith is something that is transmitted and we are formed in the faith it's not a popular opinion poll it's people are formed in the faith and that's the census fidelium that's the faith that the people that connect and combine and unify the people it's the faith that they have been uh, handed down to handed down to them had been transmitted to them that they have received you know we are to reach we are to pass on through apostolic tradition the faith that we have received not make up a new faith or or, or uh, modulate or you know change that faith uh, into something else it has to be uh, consistent with what has come before it has to be congruent with that so anyway um so a lot of people have been very much uh, kind of disappointed I think I think the the one positive thing that's come out of all this is the uh, the Pope Dogs movement. I think that's important. I think Pope Dogs uh, speak a lot to a lot of people. So, but anyway, a uh, little tongue in cheek there. Dog on it. Um, but here's the thing I would say, and and before you get totally totally angry and say I'm never watching you again, Padre, and that's your prerogative. I, I would hope we could part as friends if you decide that you don't want to hear what you have to what I've had to say today. There are, there are a lot of people that don't always agree, uh, again with me, uh, and I don't always agree with everybody. And it doesn't mean you can't be friends with people. Um, you know, I have lots of people that, you know, um, you know. It doesn't matter if a group of people. Uh, recognizes recognizes my, my faith and you know they could say I don't believe in that stuff okay fine it's, it's no skin off my nose and you may have something that I don't believe in but it doesn't mean I'm, I'm I can I have to reject you or 
paint you as a target and uh, you know and, and treat you as some horrible person but at the same time I think you can have the respect of differences and just say okay again I'm not I'm not here to uh, hurt anybody that's 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 certainly not what I what I'm about you know but I think people need to be honest with the institution that they're dealing with so but here's the thing about I think uh, Christianity in general and this is something that I think we're we, we've kind of we're, we're missing a lot and it, it applies to me, it applies to you, if you're somebody who's interested in being a, a Christian. Basically, everybody is invited, you know, to, to the gift of, the free gift of salvation. You know, Christianity is not about accommodation, it's about salvation. And we've made it more, in this day and age, in this politically correct world, about accommodation. We have to accommodate all these different, you know, whether it's lifestyles, philosophies, agendas. And, and Jesus never did that. Again, Jesus came to show us what it means to live in right relationship with God and with one another. But he primarily came to be the savior of the world. He came, as old fashioned as it sounds, to save us from our sinfulness. And so the Christian message has always been one of, you know, the, go the gospel call goes out to all the world, but the gospel call is what? Just being nice to people? No. The gospel call, and I, I encourage you to, you can read it in the scriptures, you can read it in the lives of the saints. It's about conversion. It's about conversion. It's about letting go uh, of those things that ultimately ruin my relationship with God. And let me just say this, this is a personal insight. Many of the things in our lives that we love are the things that bring us the most pain. Uh, they're the things that we wrestle with most of our lives and some of us, if we're lucky, we finally figure it out at the end going, oh, oh, now I know. That was my cross. And I didn't pick it up and follow Jesus. I was demanding my rights. I was demanding that people see it my way. And most of the time, if you look at the lives of the people in the Gospels who were changed by Jesus, they came to him as one person, but then they recognized that call to conversion to let go of their old former ways and say yes to a new way of life. And that is, has been, and always will be the message of the gospel. And that gospel is, uh, it is within a matrix that has been given to us based on sacred scripture, sacred tradition, sacred teachings of the fathers of the church. And those things just are immutable. Yes, I know it flies in the face of our contemporary world. You know, we have manipulated nature, we have uh, radically altered nature, and now we seek to actually make nature subservient to us. That's pretty arrogant, by the way. One of these days we're gonna get our, you know what's handed to us, because nature's gonna come back with a real vengeance, I think. And it's going to let us know that we really aren't as wonderful and as technological as we thought we were. You know, we're riding a nice wave of technology right now. And oh yeah, we're enjoying it. Absolutely. Hey, I'm a big techie guy, you know, as you all know. But, you know, my faith isn't, isn't in tech. It isn't in Apple, you know. It always goes back to the fundamentals of the gospel and the scriptures and the teachings of the church. Uh, does that mean that I'm always um, able to, with a, with a sense of, you know, this is easy? No. Um, the gospel call to conversion is never easy. It's always, it's always going to be a challenge. But, I will say this, it is the most rewarding. And the way you begin that conversion is by being honest with yourself, 
honest with other people, honest with God, and then let God begin. You know, I think this is part of the message of Pope Francis is trying to let that gospel, that real good news seep down into our hardened hearts. You know, don't be afraid of the gospel of Christ. You know, let it do its work. Uh, because sometimes it takes a long time for us to uh, respond to our conversion. But that, my friends, is that I think the issue is that the church has her teachings. We will hold on to those teachings because we believe they're right and true. And we're not here to oppress anybody or put anybody down because we're all called. Yes, we're all called to salvation, but we're also called to conversion. And so I hope that makes sense. And I hope maybe you got something out of that. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to, you know, listen to my, my oscitant ramblings. Uh, and again, I appreciate uh, all those of you who leave comments from time to time. I uh, have been a little bit uh, delinquent in responding to some of you. I apologize for that. But uh, I hope you're having a beautiful uh, early fall. It's a beautiful, glorious fall here in Chico. And so I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, you may be able to watch uh, the blue, the blue moon, no, the, not the blue moon, the, uh, the red moon or the harvest moon or the blood moon or whatever it's called, or the red moon, uh, and enjoy a pipe. And uh, hopefully even better, enjoying it with friends and family around you. God bless you. See you soon. Light up your world, light up your pipe. Take care now. See you soon.